Hey, security researcher here once again. Thanks for checking out this video. Let's rewind to the 1990s for a second. Are you old enough to remember this? Because I sure am. Uh, during my service in the United States uh, Congress, uh, I took the initiative in creating the Internet. And that, my friends, is where the whole Al Gore invented the Internet thing comes from. But let's be real. Al Gore didn't invent the Internet. The Internet's real origins are a lot more complex. It's a pretty long story filled with scientists, engineers, and Cold War fears. So buckle up once again, because we're about to connect the dots from something called ARPANET to the thing that's in your pocket that can answer any questions in seconds just by saying, Hey Siri? But before we get all technical, I want to take one more short detour back to 1994. Back now 56 past, I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. About, I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> uh, yeah, I heard something around big fun up in the lunchroom the other week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean. Well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What it's, do you mean? That's big? How does one, what do you write to it, like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what Internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is <laughs> what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up, made up of, uh, started from... Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a computer in the billboard. It's, it's not in there. It's, it, it's, it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide. Right. And it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Hard to believe that was less than 30 years ago. People were genuinely confused about what the Internet even was. The reality is most people back then had no idea how much of their world was about to change, and they had even less of a clue about why the internet existed in the first place. The internet was about to flip everything upside down. How we communicated, shopped, worked, understood the world, and even how we related to one another. You had this feeling of standing on the edge of something huge, but not fully grasping what was happening. And right now, we're all in the same exact boat with AI, on the edge of something massive and no idea where we're headed. If you're old like me, you probably remember the times before the internet, when you had to remember phone numbers and actually have a general sense of direction in order to get where you were going. For everyone else, imagine life without the internet for just one second. No Google searches, no Netflix, no Amazon, no social media, nothing. Even for those of us that remember life pre-internet, it's still kind of hard to picture, right? It's probably worth pointing out that the internet that you and I know today wasn't even supposed to exist, and you and I were never supposed to have access to it. It started out as a top-secret military project during the Cold War, a communications network designed to survive a nuclear attack. In fact, a lot of what you and I take for granted started with the military. Even something as simple as the Capri Sun juice pouch, that started as survival water pouches for fighter pilots in case they had to eject. Not exactly the lunchbox stable that we all know. The same holds true with computers. The first electronic digital computer, Colossus, was secretly developed and built in 1943 at the Post Office Research Laboratories in North London in the UK. This first computer was large enough to fill an entire room by itself and was created to help crack the German Enigma codes during World War II. The internet's followed a similar path. What started as a military tool has morphed into the public internet that you and I depend on today. So how exactly did it all happen? Let's go back to the late 1950s, right after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first ever man-made satellite. It was at that point that the U.S. Department of Defense decided they needed to step up their tech game. They created ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. ARPA was given the job to think outside the box, way outside the box solving problems no one else could figure out and most had never even thought of yet. This is where JCR Licklider comes in. Joseph Licklider wasn't just a computer geek, he was a visionary. In 1962, he wrote a memo about his dream for an intergalactic computer network. It's a wild name, but it's essentially what we call the internet today. His vision? A future where computers were interconnected, sharing information across the country, around the world, and beyond. 
And keep in mind, this was the 1960s. Computers were still room-sized behemoths that mostly just crunched numbers. But Licklider had a different way of thinking. He imagined a world where humans could interact with computers as naturally as we do with each other. Licklider's visionary ideas are responsible for the voice assistants that we use today, like Siri, Alexa, and even AI. So to all of you that love your voice assistants and AI, you can thank this guy, Joseph Carl Robnett Licklider, otherwise known as JCR or Lick. This period of American life was intense. The nuclear arms race was beginning to take shape, and there was a genuine fear that nuclear war could break out at any moment. And cover. Be sure and remember what Bert the Turtle just did, friends, because every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. Paul and Patty know this. No matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. And cover. That's the first thing to do. Duck and cover. And cover. First, you duck. duck. And then, and you cover. cover. You duck and duck. cover tight. And duck cover. and cover under the table. Duck. It's a bomb. And duck cover. and cover. He did what we all must learn to do. You. And you. And you. And you. So why did ARPA, later called DARPA, care about Licklider's ideas? Well, the Department of Defense gave them a pretty big problem to solve. Build a communications network that could survive a nuclear attack. The Department of Defense was concerned that if the Soviets launched missiles or dropped bombs and destroyed key infrastructure, the regular communication systems would be toast. So they wanted a system that could reroute itself if parts were completely wiped out. So in the late 1960s, they took Licklider's ideas and directed ARPA to build ARPANET, the first real network of networks. Now, ARPANET wasn't exactly the internet that you and I know today. It wasn't even public. It was strictly for researchers and government use. But on October 29, 1969, at 10.30 p.m., a graduate student at UCLA sent the very first message over ARPANET to Stanford Research Institute a few hundred miles away. The message was supposed to be log in, but the system crashed after LO, and in that moment, the internet was born. It might not have been a poetic start, but hey, history can be messy sometimes. In the early days, ARPANET was limited to just a few universities, UCLA, Stanford, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. And this wasn't anything like the user-friendly browser and websites that you and I use. This was raw command line stuff. Definitely not for the faint of heart. Before email existed, communication was far from instantaneous. ARPANET was expanding pretty rapidly and stretched across the country with more and more universities and organizations becoming a part of the project. This created a really expensive communications hurdle that a guy named Ray Tomlinson was about to solve. Ray Tomlinson was working on ARPANET at Bolt, Baranek & Newman, the company contracted to develop ARPANET, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Meanwhile, across the country, Dick Watson was contributing to ARPANET from Stanford Research Institute in California. In 1971, AT&T had a monopoly over the telecommunications system, which made a coast-to-coast -coast phone call extremely expensive, around $1 to $2 a minute, or roughly $7 to $14 in today's money. It was actually cheaper to fly across the country for a meeting than it was to have a conversation over the phone. This wasn't exactly practical when you were trying to troubleshoot a new coast-to-coast -coast computer network. So in 1971, Ray Tomlinson introduced the first email system. At the time, nobody had any idea just how transformative email would become. It was initially a simple tool to exchange short messages over ARPANET. Tomlinson also gave us the at symbol to route messages, a small detail that changed everything. So to those of you that use email every day, you can thank this guy. Thanks, Ray. As ARPANET grew, it didn't take long for the technical limitations to start popping up. The network was expanding rapidly, but connecting different systems was starting to get tricky. Every network had its own way of communicating, and it was like trying to get people that spoke entirely different languages to understand one another. Enter Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn. In the mid-1970s, Cerf and Kahn developed something revolutionary. 
Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, TCP IP. Think of it as the universal language that made it possible for networks to communicate with each other no matter their differences. This breakthrough is essentially the Rosetta Stone moment for the digital world, translating between systems and allowing them to connect seamlessly. Thanks to TCP IP, ARPANET didn't just remain a closed off network. It evolved into something much, much bigger, the internet. The internet protocol is woven into the fabric of everything we do. If we change this protocol, then we could change society. Every business, no matter how large, no matter how small, will be on the internet in the year 2000. This thing didn't build itself. Millions of people across every culture have been plugging things in, running cables across oceans, installing servers, building data centers, all to make this work. The web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams. I think uh, that the web is going to be profound in what it does to our society. The internet is the largest engineering project the Earth has ever seen, and we're just getting started. Without this key innovation, we'd still be stuck in the dark ages of communication, with isolated networks and no global web. So the next time you're browsing the internet, you can thank Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn for building the foundation that makes it all possible. But with this growing network, how do you even begin to find things? That's where Elizabeth Fiendler and her team at Stanford Research Institute step in. Fiendler and her team were basically the librarians of ARPANET, quietly laying the groundwork for how we navigate the web today. They were the masterminds behind ARPANET's early directory services, which would eventually evolve into something we all take for granted, the domain name system. Fiendler's team didn't just catalog and organize the chaos. They assigned the very first domain names and pioneered the systems of top-level domains that you and I use today, like .com, .edu, and .gov. Before DNS, finding a site meant memorizing a string of numbers like 172.16.42.1. Not exactly user-friendly. Thanks to Fiendler, instead of juggling numbers, we got to use memorable names like YouTube.com or Google.com. Fiendler's work transformed the complicated, clunky system into something anyone could use, bringing the web one step closer to becoming the global resource it is today. At this point, all the pieces were in place, but the internet still needed that spark, that one catalyst event to push it into the mainstream. And in the late 1980s, it finally happened. While working at CERN, Tim Berners-Lee came up with the game-changing idea, the World Wide Web. This wasn't just another technical upgrade, it was a system of linked documents that transformed the way we navigate the internet. No longer did you need to be a tech expert to use the web. It was designed so that anyone could point, click, and explore. And here's an important distinction worth noting. The internet and the World Wide Web are not the same things. The internet is the underlying network of networks. While well, the World Wide Web is the system of linked documents and web pages we use to navigate it. The web is what you think of when I say the words internet. Tim Berners-Lee's invention was the catalyst event that set everything in motion. Thanks, Tim. Now the internet wasn't just for academics and military contractors. It was for everyone. Thanks to companies like AOL, Prodigy, and CompuServe, the internet found its way into everyday homes. You've got mail. But even from its earliest days, privacy concerns were bubbling up. Enter Willis Ware, a brilliant visionary who worked for the Rand Corporation. Willis Ware predicted all of the privacy issues we're dealing with today, except maybe the general public's apathetic response to the problem. Back in the 1960s, Willis warned that as soon as computers started sharing personal information, trying to maintain some semblance of privacy would become an absolute nightmare. Fast forward to now, and he was spot on. Data is centralized, and surveillance is everywhere. And it wasn't just the government Ware was worried about. Willis Ware saw that private companies would jump at the chance to turn all of this data into profit. 
And now you and I live in a world where every tap, every movement we make, everything heard or said is tracked by our phones, laptops, cars, all of it part of a massive ad tech surveillance ecosystem. If you want a deeper dive into ad tech, check out my video, Are Phones Really Spying on Us? I'll link to it at the end of this video. Trust me, it'll open your eyes. Now, speaking of the 1990s, when the internet really took off, the U.S. government stepped in and created something called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. ICANN was created in order to manage domain names and keep things running smoothly. In 2016, ICANN became independent, but don't think for one second the U.S. government's out of the picture. Through agencies like the FCC and FTC, the government can still set internet policies from privacy laws to net neutrality. And let's not forget, the Internet's roots are in the military. In 1983, ARPANET split into MILNET for military use, and the civilian ARPANET eventually became the Internet that you and I know today. So is the government still controlling the Internet? That's a tricky question, and I'm going to do my best to break it down without getting myself into trouble. Back in 1998, we needed someone to manage the domain names and IP addresses, and that's where ICANN came in. The U.S. had oversight for a while, but in 2016, ICANN became independent. Still, the U.S. government plays a big role. Agencies like the FBI, NSA, and Homeland Security monitor the Internet for various threats. When it comes to censorship, the U.S. government can't outright block content thanks to free speech laws, but a collaboration with tech companies to moderate and suppress certain things has recently come to light, and the reality is, if you and I don't speak up about our rights, it's only going to get worse. So while ICANN is independent, the U.S. government is still very much involved in how the Internet functions. Every country has its own approach. It's just how the game works. You and I are living in a world that people like Willis Ware, Tim Berners-Lee, and Vince Cerf could have only dreamed of. A world where the Internet is a daily necessity. And just like in the 1960s when ARPANET first connected the country, we're at the dawn of another seismic shift. Artificial intelligence. So here's the big question that I have for everybody. Looking back at the internet's journey, was it a net positive or a net negative for humanity? Did we fully grasp the massive changes it brought, or did it sneak up on us and leave us scrambling to keep up? I really do want to know what you think. Has the internet been more of a blessing or a curse? Drop your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, share your biggest wow moment with the internet so far. Let me know whether you're a 60s, 70s, or 80s kid who remembers the days before the web, or a Gen Zer who's been online since birth, your opinion genuinely matters to me. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the internet's impact, hit that like button, share it with someone who needs a tech history refresher, and don't forget to subscribe so that you're always in the loop. We've just scratched the surface of where we're headed next, and if you're excited about the future of tech as much as I am, consider supporting the channel on Patreon or by joining as a member. I'm always up for chatting with you guys about everything that's coming up next in tech, and trust me, there's a lot more on the horizon. Until next time, stay curious, stay connected, do what you can to stay safe, and remember, the future's ours to shape, together. Be good.